Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books Network. I am Stephen Pimper, a host of the Public Policy Channel. And today we are pleased to welcome Anthony Warner, who is the author of Ending Hunger, The Quest to Feed the World Without Destroying It, from One World Books in London. Anthony, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, yeah. Thank you for having me on. So uh, before we dive in and talk about the book, I wonder if you might tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and maybe a bit about your background and how you came to this project. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm Anthony Warner. I'm a, a chef based in the UK. Um, and uh, a few years ago, I wrote, uh, I started writing a blog. It essentially, it started off about sort of pseudoscience in the world of food. Um, and it was originally just intended to share with his friends and, and colleagues, but it, it became quite popular in the UK fairly quickly and has somehow um, mutated into a trilogy of books, of which, of which this is the final book covering um, the sustainability of our food systems and the environmental impact of food and how that plays against the, the quest to end hunger around the world. Terrific. So let's let's see if we can't figure out a way to give listeners a, a, a sense of the book. One of the things that I appreciate very much about it is is the sheer sort of ambition and scope of it, because you're writing about hunger, but you're also writing about global food systems, the history of those systems, and sort of how they are functioning in their current instantiation. You're talking about the role of population growth historically, the present and potentially into the future, and then all of that in the context of climate change. Um, so let's why don't we start here? You you write that in our quest to fight hunger, we have utterly ruined the planet. Have we? Is it is it that bad in yeah. your estimation? I mean in some ways it is. I mean you have to look at um food production and when when you look at the impact of food production on our planet, it is by quite a distance, they're the most environmentally destructive of all human activities. I know that people will talk about climate change, we'll talk about fossil fuels, which obviously are incredibly damaging as well. But um, food has an impact not only on climate change, it's responsible for you know around about 25% of our global climate change emissions, but also impacts hugely on land use, hugely on habitat destruction, hugely on, you know, um, species extinction hugely on our water systems and it also you know, impacts upon our soil it impacts upon desertification of the land and, and and all it has all these sort of wide-ranging impacts particularly to the natural world you know producing food in in an agricultural system is an assault on the natural world and and causes huge damage to it i mean i, I play that very very much against the in the book that we can't just stop producing food. You know, agriculture is not only the most destructive of human activities, it's also the most important of human activities. You know, farming is is the most essential. We, we could all do without pretty much any industry on the planet for a reasonable amount of time, apart from agriculture and food production, without which we'd all be dead within a few weeks. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying agriculture is destructive and, and, and should, should be stopped. I'm saying agriculture... And the production of food and the ending of hunger by its nature almost is incredibly destructive. And we need to work out ways of doing it better if we're going to, if it's going to be sustainable long to the future. Because at the moment, it's not. It's incredibly destructive in all those ways that I discussed um, before. So why don't why don't we take maybe a, a, a few of those pieces and talk about the, the the destruction that the current system causes, and then maybe your thoughts about ways in which we might do something about that. Mm. Um, but you, you you talked uh, at some length about soil in the book, which was I will confess something I knew less about than some of the other areas. Talk about the ways in which modern systems of al- agriculture affect soil and what the longer term impacts of that are likely to be. Yeah, um, it's yeah, it is incredibly important soil, and it's something that we don't think enough about. I, I suppose part of that is something to do with the way our modern life is structured. Is really, you know, we, we we think of soil as just being dirt and something to be cleaned away and something to be forgotten about. We forget how incredibly important it is. It supports, you know, the vast majority of of, of terrestrial life on, on the planet. In some ways, supported by this very very thin, quite fragile layer of of stuff which covers. Um, a large amount of the planet, it's sort of kind of a, 
the interface between geology and biology, really, and the way stuff gets broken down into into a soil. And obviously, soil is, has a lot of organic matter. It has it has a has a microbiome, I suppose. Lots of lots of um, bacteria and lots of lots of um, fungi and, and, and various different organisms living within it. It's a living thing when you pick it up and you know hold it in hold it in your hand. There's millions and millions and billions of different organisms in there. And um, so you know. We, we forget about that how important it is, and we forget about what a fragile and living thing it is. Um, and agriculture has not done very well, or modern agriculture particularly, has not done very well in preserving the soil. Um, for a start, ploughing of the soil is, is a very destructive thing to do to, do to it. You know, and that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years, and it essentially breaks up and, and destroys a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the life within soil if you plough it and you turn it over. Um, breaks up sort of um, fungal um, mycelia that run through the soil and also just lets air in and, and, and a lot of the bacterial life within the soil is killed. So that 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 kills a lot of the life within the soil and also uh, and releases carbon into the soil. And, you know, that in itself is has been quite a destructive thing because, you know, as you plough soil, it, it gradually loses its life. It gradually loses the organic matter within it and it releases carbon. It releases large amounts of carbon. We don't quite realise how large that amount of carbon that it releases is perhaps i think since the beginning of agriculture or actually since the beginning of the industrial revolution the amount of carbon released by burning fossil fuels is 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 equivalent you know, of an equivalent magnitude to the amount of carbon that's been released from the release of organic matter from the soil our soil has less and less um, carbon content in it now um, just because of the way we farm part of that is due to plowing Part of that is due to um, sort of fertilising the soil. A lot of um, a lot of bacteria in the soil have this this, this interaction with plant roots, and you know, plants um, have you know, st structures of fungi and bacteria which which interact with with the roots. And if you add fertiliser to the soil, it, it removes the plant's need to to um, have that interaction with with bacteria and with microorganisms. And that essentially, you know, because because Previously, plants had this sort of synergy with, with, with microorganisms, which helped them break down organic matter and help them get nutrients from decaying organic matter. Without that, if you're adding nitrogen directly to the soil, that removes the need to have those bacterial associations with roots, and you end up with a, with a dry and, 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 to some extent, dead soil. And so, even though the development of artificial fertilizers was absolutely essential for producing enough food to feed the planet and to, for, for fighting hunger, um, it, it also had a, had a negative effect on the on the life within the soil, and I think we're only just in the last sort of sort of thirty forty years starting to understand the implications of that, and starting to understand that actually creating a sustainable agriculture requires really thinking about the soil in, in an intelligent way and finding new ways to to build back those connections between between microorganisms and plant roots and get more carbon into the soil. And what I will say is, oh, well, sorry, sorry, no, go ahead. I think one of the most important things to know about that is this: even though um, you know we think about the the negative climate impacts of, of, um, of agriculture, um, if you can find ways to increase that amount of carbon stored in the soil, it's one of the best ways to take carbon out of the atmosphere. It's one of the few really really positive ways, other than reforesting large amounts of land. It's one of the really good ways of removing a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and actually help pulling back climate change to some extent. Not a complete solution, but it's something that we can do do you know almost immediately and we know how to do that could actually help to remove a large amount of carbon from the atmosphere. So if if you, as I'm I'm sure you do, if you read and look at sort of more more popular discussion of of modern ag agriculture, there's a lot of attention that is paid to the production of meat, there's a lot of focus often on uh, uh, cows, right? The sheer amount of land that needs to be cleared for their grazing and then the methane that they themselves produce. Um, and you will then hear that that carried into suggestions from some people that, well, what we really need to do is make everybody a vegetarian and then the problem goes away. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the dynamic here? What role does meat play in this? And and if we make everybody a vegetarian tomorrow, do we fix it all? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's fair to say that there is, there is, you know, some truth in those sort of arguments, but they're far, 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 far from being the whole truth. 
Um, and that's you know, common with a lot of a lot of the subjects I write about. People try and offer simple solutions to, to genuinely complex, difficult problems. Um, meat is a very inefficient way to produce um, edible protein, and production of meat is a very inefficient way of doing that. Cows are particularly inefficient. Um, you know, they require a lot of land um, in order to produce a, a small amount of meat. They require a lot of water. They're, they're very resource heavy in terms of a, a vehicle for producing meat, and it's much easier perhaps to um to eat plant protein that's grown directly and it's much less resource intensive and you know the, the industrial production of meat especially is is one of the most destructive aspects of our modern agricultural system that said i i do believe very firmly that there is a place for a certain amount of meat within an agricultural system to create a more efficient food system overall i just think right now we eat far 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 too much meat unfortunately um, and we produce it in, in a way that is you know a little bit backwards so much, a lot of our meat is produced in in feedlots and fed soya grown on on you know pretty good agricultural land so you grow soya or, or palm or whatever on fairly good agricultural land and then you use that to create cattle feed to feed cattle that's a very inefficient way to produce food where animals like cows and ruminants are, are particularly good is the is they can they can get protein out of pretty marginal, low-quality land, which you can't really grow anything else on. Um, so you can graze them on areas where you would struggle to grow crops. And, uh, you know, especially uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the UK at the moment, and we have a huge amount of, of rain in the west of our country. And, um, you know, that's a pretty good place to raise cattle and, 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 and um, grow beef or, or, or produce dairy. Um, because you're not worried about the large amounts of water that you're having to use. But in other parts of the world, it's not great great to grow cattle, and you'd be better off doing either doing other things or returning that land to, to, to a natural landscape, because you know, cattle can be extremely destructive. It, certainly in, in dry land especially, they're, they're, they're quite damaging for the soil in, in similar ways to the, the, the ploughing can be. But in the right context, the right sort of beef production can actually be quite good and, and, and can have, you know, can have a lot of biodiversity around it. You can have a lot of, you, know, you can share a lot of land that you're grazing cattle on with nature. And, and like I said, it, for, for some areas of land and for some people, actually, it's you know, for some, some people in the poorest parts of the world, raising a few cattle is the only way you can make a living out of that particular piece of land. So it's all very well telling those people, you know, you should go vegan or you should go vegetarian. But if you do tell them that, the likelihood is those people are going to starve. So I think saying the whole world should go vegan or vegetarian is far too simplistic. But we weigh, way too much meat, like by an order of magnitude too much currently. And that's increasing globally at a rate of about 3% every year as a lot of the world tries to catch up with the meat consumption of the UK and, and the US and places like Brazil. So, you know, we're heading very much in the wrong direction. We need to be heading back the other way. But I do, I mean, I love eating meat. I, you know, I'm a chef, so it's something I, I, I think we should eat far more of and celebrate far more and enjoy it far more. But, you know, we really need to to cut back quite dramatically. How 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 do you how do you hit that sweet spot in in your own cooking? Right. Knowing that people often, you know, certainly, you know, large chunks of Westerners, they expect a giant portion of meat to be the center point of the meal. How do you how do you deal with that in your own work? Um, I, I think it's very difficult. I mean, yeah, yeah, people expect to have meat at the center of the meal and have a large portion of meat at the center of the meal. Sometimes that's OK. You know, I wouldn't say you should never do that. Um, but I think that should be a rare occasion that you do. Um, and generally speaking, what, what I try to do is, is I always I'm always worried about telling people not to do stuff, to tell people, yeah, you shouldn't eat this, this is bad, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that, within reason. I think we should be free to eat whatever we want. But what I, what I like to do in my work, and what a lot of my work actually centers around these days, is encouraging people to eat more plant-based food and enjoy more plant-based food and enjoy plant proteins, enjoy lentils and beans and pulses and all those, you know, and all different vegetables and all the flavors and textures that they can provide. And sometimes to cook, Dishes which are based on those things maybe have a small amount of meat in, you know, just to, to give it flavour and to, to, to make it into a, a more complete meal. So I think that's the key, always do, really, in terms of behaviour change. It, it's making people desire those sort of foods and making them those sort of foods make sense in people's lives so they're as convenient and as appropriate um, consumption for 
everyday real life, you know, rather than giving people un, unrealistic um, ideals of having to cook absolutely every single meal from scratch and, and, and learn, learn thousands of new recipes. So in, in that vein, what do you think of, of the suggestions that the way out of this particular dilemma is insects, much less resource intensive, super high in protein, getting large segments of the population to regularly convert to insects is one of the, the ways forward. What do you think about that as a, a, a possible path? Um, I, I mean, I'm never convinced. And I, I look at a lot of these alternative proteins um, in research for the book and in my work in life and i'm insects are not something i'm convinced about purely because i don't think they're incredibly delicious um and i think there are better options um and more palatable and more acceptable options in in just like the plant protein things like chickpeas and lentils and that sort of thing i think are better options um i think there might be a role for insects sometimes and um, they're quite good at um using up food waste you know so you can you can produce produce good quality protein out of just the stuff you're going to throw away um and they might have some pretty good options as an alternative source of of animal feed you know particularly for for for, for chickens so there are some sort of regulatory problems with that at the moment but they're kind of being worked for at the moment so i think there might be a, a role for insects in 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 animal feed there might be some role in 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 um you know in feeding them to people but you know i've not seen a use of cricket flour or mealworm flour which is is better than the chickpea or lentil flour if i'm really honest and i think those right. sort of plant-based based protein options are, are probably probably a better way forward and obviously don't have just sort of the cultural barriers to overcome yeah. in order to convince people to use them yeah i mean one of the problems with insects is you have to eat the whole thing including all the bits that you might not want to want to think about you, know, you can't you can't fill it and fill it a cricket <laughs> words to live by you can't fill it a cricket yeah. um so uh, sort of as we're 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 touring our way through the uh the kinds of alternatives that listeners may be familiar with as as we confront possible challenges for there being sufficient sustainable food into the future uh you will likewise all uh, often hear people talk about increasing excuse me the um uh, people's dependence on local sources of food. And then often in the same breath, they will talk about increasing the quantity of organic foods that are available to people. Can you talk a little bit about how you think of, of those two paths? Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not, um, I'm not anti local eating local food. I think you should understand the food that grows around you. You should should celebrate the, the things that are produced well in in your local area. You know, I, I live in a part of the, the UK which is famous for its agriculture and famous for its food. It's Lincolnshire, which is where we grow most of our or, or a large proportion of our our arable, arable farming takes place. And, and you know, I understand the agriculture, and then there's interesting local foods and local delicacies which which I think are are worth savouring and worth um, worth celebrating. Um, that said. I, I really worry um, about local food, particularly, uh, and that when people start to push towards this idea that we should be eating everything locally, um, because that's often not the best idea in terms of your diet. You know, in terms of in terms of getting a varied and interesting diet, which is always the, the healthiest diets are the ones that are most varied and ones that are most interesting and ones that are least restrictive. Um, and you know, from an environmental perspective, often. You know, it makes sense to to produce um, food and in in areas where it's where it's well suited for production of those foods. An example, a classic example I would give um, is something like uh, tomatoes. Now it's too cold where I am now to to grow tomatoes for almost the entire year. So if I want to eat a tomato, that I have the options of buying something locally, which is grown in a in a in a hot house, which is heated by electricity. Or buying something from somewhere in southern Europe, which is grown under under glass, probably, but without without artificial heat, and is driven across across Europe. Now, you might think that driving it across Europe would have this sort of high climate impact, but actually, when you work it out, it, you know, the, the, the sensible option environmentally is to buy the one that's, that's, that's come from Europe that hasn't been heated in a in a in a, artificially heated in a, in a in a hot house. So, you know. And actually, if you look at environmental impact of food, even in places like the US and the UK, where it's at its highest, the um, food 
transportation costs are probably about 10% of the environmental impact and um, climate change impact of, of that product. So, so, you know, choosing locally is kind of nice, but if you, if you're, it's not necessarily always the best option environmentally. It's, you know, people use it as a simple guide to, to reducing their environmental impact. It's often misleading. Um, and also, you know, I, 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 you know, our food system develops to be a, a global one for good reason, because that made it more efficient and, and we had better diets as a result from, from trading with around the world and, and from shipping things around. Places like the UK, for instance, um, we, we can only produce about 60% of the calories we consume. We have to import about 40% of the calories. And that's been the case for like 200 years. You know, we, we haven't been self-sufficient in food in this country for a long, long time. That's not necessarily a problem, but, you know, we, we should be careful to get into this um, this uh, idea of we have to eat everything locally. And it's actually quite a sort of, it can become quite an isolationist, quite a sort of jingoistic um, argument. It's popular with a lot of, um, you know, if you look at the history of far-right politics, you know, local food movements were often at the centre of them um, in the 1930s, especially um, throughout Europe. So I think we have to be worried about where that crosses over to sort of an insular nationalism as well. You know, it's often the acceptable face of, of something which is quite extreme on the right. Um, so I, I'm not, you know, I think we should we should eat sensibly and 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 look at the di- you know, different foods from a sort of more objective rather than trying to use labels like local. As for organic. Organic is a system of agriculture which which has been around for you know well, I mean probably um, not not far off a hundred years probably more like eighty years or so we've had various systems of, of organic production um, from an environmental perspective it is um, interesting in that there's it's generally quite low in in terms of of chemicals onto the, onto the production which which does often reduce the some aspects of envir- the environmental impact, but you know it has a lot of problems environmentally with it. People would be very surprised to look at life cycle analysis of, of organic food production, essentially because organic food production tends to be very inefficient. It tends to be very poor at producing, um, you know, an amount of crops on on a, on a set amount of land. So you, you're going to get far more production using a non-organic system, perhaps using a nitrogen fertilizer or using some sort of a control for some sort of chemical control for pests um, and weeds than you would be if you're not using that. So th- that inefficiency of organic systems tends to make it not a great method of food production and tends to increase its environmental impact because you know you are still having to do stuff to the field. You are still having to put energy into, the, into producing crops. You know, and, and you do still get those that sort of uh, loss of um, loss of carbon from the soil, for instance. So you know, organic systems are, I think, when you look at every aspect of them environmentally, they tend to not play out very well if you're looking at minimising your impact on the environment. And that said, I will give them their credit. They do they, 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 organic agriculture has been ahead of the game for a long, long time in understanding the importance of the soil. Which I don't think that you know other forms of agriculture have done um, over the years, um, and and have also been not bad at creating sort of uh, strategies for managing pests, managing weeds, which are more agricultural than chemical. You know, different types of crop rotation, different types of cover crops, and that sort of thing. Um, what I will say is one of the one of the big problems of organic is that um, you know, probably the most one of the most important revolutions in 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 agriculture around the world has been the development of um, no-till and uh, minimum till um, farming so basically not plowing the land between crops so you'll grow a crop and then you'll just sort of um, flatten down crop residue and and put put seeds in you know without without plowing Um, and that's actually been shown to be a very good way of regenerating land but unfortunately, that does rely on use of use of um, chemical fertilizers, particularly glyphosate. And without that in, in, in agriculture, no till becomes impossible. So, so you know, if you're not using um, sort of chemical methods of, of controlling weeds, often you have to use more plowing, which is one of the most destructive um, things you can do to the soil. So, uh, you know, no till systems are, are incredibly important in the future of agriculture. Organic, pretty much. Um, some people will dispute this, but pretty much, it's impossible to do with organic agriculture. Um, and you know, the other important point, which I make at length in the book, is that um, organic. It, you know, one of the big problems with organic is 
that that it, it, it would be impossible to move all of agriculture to organic and continue to feed people as we do, because there is a limit to how much food you can produce without using nitrogen fertilizer. And we were reaching that limit at around about the you know, sort of turn of the uh, turn of the twentieth century, um, and it, you know it was a, a scientific um, innovation to capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, using the Harvard Bosch process, which meant that we could continue to feed people without without mass starvation all that time ago. So without a nitrogen fertilizer, you can probably just about feed three three and a half billion people on the planet. And then you, know, you can do that calculation. That can be that can be worked out pretty accurately. How many people the planet could support without nitrogen fertilizer? Beyond that, you know, then then you just can't feed that many people. Um, so you know, if you want to stop using nitrogen fertilizer, then you would have to get rid of half the world's population, which I don't think would be a very, very popular um, decision. So that that feels like the perfect segue because we've we've talked a lot about uh, the inefficiencies and and uh, potential efficiencies of global food production systems. But this is a book that that has at its heart questions about hunger. How do we ensure that? How is how is it that we have managed to feed so many people, although still, you know, depending on how you do these math, the math we're looking at, what, maybe 800 million people worldwide who have insufficient access to food they and their family need. Um, but population that is growing um how do how do how do we in your mind think about productively squaring this circle uh you said just now and and point to in the book that you are uh, uh not particularly persuaded by you know malthusian or or eugenicist notions of reducing population size in that way so if we're uh going to see population continuing to grow and we're going to see growing threats to our ability literally to inhabit the planet because of the things that we are doing to it. How, how, how would you encourage people to think about what we individually and then collectively through our nation's policies, what should we be doing about that? Hmm. Yeah. Um, th- these are, these are huge questions, obviously. Um, and you know, quite challenging questions. And I actually, I'll be honest. When I started writing the book, I didn't, couldn't envisage an answer to them which which made any sort of sense or wasn't incredibly, um, incredibly pessimistic. Um, because you know, you look at the world population, it, it, it's you know, expanding, 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 and obviously that must have a limit somewhere. Um, as as you know, Malthusian um, thinking would would tell you. But I, I think when you look at world population, you look at the sort of people who are involved in, 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 in predicting world population, it's actually a metric which which can be predicted with quite a lot of accuracy um, long into the future. No other sort of economic uh, metric could can be quite so well predicted long into the future with such with such confidence. Um, th- then you do see that yeah, population is growing, but you know, and actually there's been lots of there's been lots of um, attempts to try and control that and to try and bring that down and to try and find ways of controlling the population in the past. They're all generally terrible and have you know horrible outcomes. Um, but the only real way that has ever been successful is lifting people out of poverty. Because as people lift out of poverty, especially as women are lifted out of poverty, you know, population growth tends to slow down. And you know, you look at Europe, you look at the US, um, Generally speaking, our population growth in places like Japan um, is is slowing, and perhaps even you know perhaps even um, below um, replacement levels in some some countries now. And that as 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 prosperity grows around the world, that will continue. And predictions are that we will continue to increase population now, and it probably up until you know sort of uh, towards the end of end of this um, this century. Um, but it will level out um, at around about 10 million people and probably sort of fall, fall slightly or, or maintain around that sort of level. Um, and so, you know, there, there is an end to population growth, believe it or not. And Malthus predicted that it would just carry on growing forever. Um, but it seems now that it's kind of more of an S-shaped curve and, and, and will level out. And it, so if we can continue to feed people and continue to keep people out of out of poverty, then then we have a, a real chance of, of, of staying, you know, staying above 
you know, keeping our heads above water and producing food, if we can produce food in a more sustainable way. We don't at the moment, we don't produce food sustainably, sustainably at all, but you know, there is a chance that we can do that. There is a vision of a future where, where, where hunger is, is eliminated. Um, and, and even now, um, you know, hunger is, is in, in the world, that exists in the world, like you said, 800 million people, which is a shocking number of people who, who genuinely don't have enough food to eat every single day. Um, but that hunger and, and certainly large scale famine is always human made. It's not, you know, it's, it's not um, because we can't produce enough food. It's because we, we can produce enough food. We just don't distribute it properly because of unfair um, society, because of economics, because of because of um, sort of social issues and political issues. Um, so, you yeah, know, hunger is a social political um, thing right now um, and it will continue to be. Um, and if we can get past that, then, then then perhaps there's some hope. But you know, I think the really important point is that that you know the population growth is not unlimited, um, and there is a point where we will we, we it will level out, and there is a chance that we can you know the planet is big enough and has enough energy falling on it from the sun to to make sustainable living possible. And we, there's kind of a vision of how we can do that. The problem is. The big problem is we're just not doing it. We're not making the, the changes needed that need to be made in order for the po- like human population to be a sustainable one that doesn't end in a climate disaster or, or an ecological disaster. And, and this is this is a slightly unfair question, but I will ask it anyway, because uh, it's a little bit outside the corners of the book. But I mean, how I mean, that that's this is always the dilemma, right? It's like it's not that we don't know what to do to make food production more sustainable. It is creating the political will to actually do it. Do you have any insight as, as to, to how you think maybe just thinking about UK policy, how that might be at least advanced a bit? Or do you see signs of that happening? Do you see signs of hope? I, I, I see signs. I see a lot of signs of, of really good stuff going on around the world. I mean, it just seems very uh, not not very joined up, really. I think I, I would say. Um, so um, you know, there, there's bits of policy. I mean, actually, the UK has some interesting um, um, ag- agricultural policies coming through. We're looking at you know, there's this huge lever, this huge and important lever, um, which you can use. In order to make a better agriculture, which is which is global agricultural subsidies, which are to the tune of like half a trillion dollars a year, um, and using them better. You know, right now, they used to increase increase production. They used to subsidise meat production. They used to subsidise production of, of commodity crops. In the UK, we are looking to shift that towards um, you know subsidising uh, things that agriculture does that, that are a public good. You know, essentially. Making um, our water systems better, creating habitats for, for, for to increase biodiversity, capturing carbon from the soil, and we are looking at the moment in the UK to reshape agricultural subsidy and reshape agricultural policy to kind of make a better agriculture, and you know that does look positive, um, but it, it, it is you know unfortunately. The consumption patterns do tend to tend to shape a lot of these things. I mean, probably the most important thing to to remember is that within the world, there are you know there's probably a billion people who who have quite a nice quite a nice sort of uh, quite a nice life and quite a nice lifestyle. There are you know um, probably six or seven um, billion other people who who you know are having a, a far less good time and want a life a bit more like you know the, the, the prosperous. Um, billion and the, the future of the planet is going to be shaped by the needs and wants of those people who want a better life, um, and you know, not by the behaviour of, of, of sort of um, farming in, in, in affluent countries like the UK. Um, that said, I hope that if we can do a really good job of reshaping UK agriculture for the better, maybe that can be a model that gets used in, in different parts of the world and get, gets shifted out. Because, like I said, there's lots of interesting things going on around the world. Um, there's lots of interesting programs to develop a better better agricultural system. They're just not very joined up, and too much of agriculture is based around you know high volume production, mostly of livestock, and with little um, attention paid to to preserving biodiversity. There's a huge amounts of forest. You know, one of one of the things I I forgot to mention earlier in terms of the environmental impact of food is that if we don't change the way we eat and produce food soon, then by 2050 
we will have cut down all the tropical forests in the world. So not just like a few, you know, but literally every single tropical forest around the world. So the whole of the Amazon, the whole of the Central African rainforest, the whole of the Indonesian Borneo rainforest, you know, so we need to, we need to, in order for that not to happen, it's essential that that doesn't happen, but in order for that not to happen, we need to have dramatic global change in the way we eat and produce food. And, you know, that is going to be difficult. There is interesting stuff going on, but, you know, it needs a dramatic rethink in how we, how we shape the world and how we sort of address sort of poverty issues. Because it's all very well for us to say to people in Brazil or, or Borneo or Indonesia, don't cut down your forests because we don't want you to. But, you know, if I look around at the UK now, we cut all our forests down many, many years ago and we've destroyed all of our natural habitats. Um, so, you know, who are we without actually paying for that change? Who are we to say you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing this? You shouldn't be doing it. Because for many people, that's the only way they have of making a living and, and bring themselves out of poverty, which you know, everybody want, around the world wants to do. So unless we can create more equality unless we can say if we want to protect this bit of rainforest we're, we're willing to pay for that as a as an essential and valuable global resource then you know it's going to be very problematic to create real change you are listening to the new books network uh i'm stephen pimper host of the public policy channel and we have been speaking with anthony warner about his new book ending hunger the quest to feed the world without destroying it uh Thank you very much for joining us today, Anthony. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.